Hello, and welcome to Smash Fiction, the podcast where we pit two or more characters against each other in a battle of strength or wits or skitterbrained hand to hand killing and see who would win. This week, Lilu versus River Tam. Astro Kerfuffle Part 3 Rise of the Kung Fu Kerfuffles. <laughs> Space has done it again. <laughs> <laughs> Two groups are ensnarled in a bit of a Donnybrook, a fracas, a rumpus. Yep, this whole thing is turned into a complete willowa. <laughs> Damn it, space! Can't you stay unkerfuffled for five minutes? <laughs> ah, space. It remains unforthcoming on its relative kerfuffliness. Typical. Well, Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg has a plan to make this kerfuffle turn out in his favor. The Mangalores let him down the first time, but after going through his Astro Rolo deck, he's hired some extra help. The crew of the Serenity has been asked to retrieve some special rocks for him. Nothing, you know, disastrous or murdersome, just some pleasant <laughs> rocks that he wants. The crew of the Serenity is insurance in case the Mangalores biff it again, and they probably will. Brack, damn it, you can't trust those Multar fucking Mangalores to do anything. Zorg doesn't like to take the name of the Space Ghost Pantheon in vain, but sometimes the situation really does demand it. Clearly. Zorg couldn't have predicted that Lilu and Corbin would be there to stop his plan. So, when all hell breaks loose on the pleasure cruise, Corbin is faced with aliens and a pissed off Jane Cobb. Mangalores are faced with Mal and Zoe. Ruby Rod is faced with how unbearable his day has gotten. <laughs> <laughs> Cruise employees Christian Danielson and Richard Bethke hide out behind the bar waiting for it to be over. I could have interned on the starship Heart of Gold with Zaphod Beeblebrox, but no. I wanted to spend some time enjoying myself before building a career, Richard laments. Christian nods sympathetically. Yeah, I turned down working a smuggling gig with some Millennium Kestrel guy. He seemed really cool, too. I just wasn't ready to commit to being an outlaw yet, I guess. Despite their different career goals, they are bonded by the madness around them. The two sigh and clink glasses. Largely unnoticed and trying to get the precious alien stones while chaos reigns around her is River Tam, a slight barefooted girl looking supernaturally intent on her goal. On the other side of the room is Lilu, flexing her punching muscles and blowing a lock of orange hair out of her face as she moves towards the stones. They lock eyes. There's melee combat boxing them in, and abandoned weapons and improvised weapons left lying around. Each of them knows they need to get to the stones, and to do it they must get through the fighters, and then get through each other. Who will win in this spectacular scuffle? Well, I flunked my precog correspondence course, so I, Megan Bob, will be your impartial judge this week. <laughs> <laughs> Representing Team River are Dan Mulcairn. I can kill you with my brain. And Miles Schneiderman. The human body can be drained of bullshit in 8.6 seconds given adequate <laughs> vacuuming systems. Ew. But who wants that? Ew. <laughs> oh, oh, so gross. I love it. <laughs> Representing Team Lilu are Kit Mulcairn. This will probably be said multiple times during this episode, so I'm just going to get out of the way now. Multipass. Multipass. <laughs> Thank multipass, you. Multipass, multipass. Thank you for that. Kit Mulcairn, multipass. And Sharon Schneiderman. Me? Feisty element. Supreme Schneiderman. Me? <laughs> bullshit you. <laughs> oh, so All uh, over you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dan, Dan, do you have your, uh, your your couch all ready for tonight? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> all prepared. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, I mean, this is a spouse fight. It does not matter yeah. who wins or who loses. Somebody is sleeping on a couch. <laughs> My back hurts. I can't be on the couch, so he has to be. Damn it. <laughs> Look, all I'm uh, going to say is between the two couples, one person has the fifth element listed as her favorite movie, and it's not Kit. So if anyone's in danger of couch surfing, <laughs> I don't think it's me. Damn it! This, oh, is nice. really, this is looking increasingly oh, no. like I'm spending on that couch. I'm I think so. In order to determine who went first this week, I asked the advocates to try and make me less afraid of space. Miles shrugged and said, it's just a dark, endless, cold hug from eternity. Why is that scary? <laughs> That's, that does sound like me. <laughs> yeah, boy, does it. 
Dan <laughs> desperately tried to do damage control by saying that eternity was just cold because it had been outside recently and that it definitely would turn on some lights and would only hug me if we were friends and we'd agree we were both into hugs, but it was too late. I had already hidden under the couch. Aww. And Sharon drew some friendly cartoons of space in the style of the DNA strand from Jurassic Park. But then I got afraid that there might be space velociraptors and then Kit got really excited and started drawing velociraptors in spacesuits and I got even more scared and hid under a different couch. Oh, but well, look how cute they are with the bubble helmets. Ah, ah, stop it. In the end, Sharon saved the day by looking directly up at the sky and telling space to fuck off. <laughs> by the Which narrowest like margin, her. Team Lilu will be going first. Oh, boy. <laughs> Team Lilu, wind blows, fire burns, rain falls. Advocates argue. Do you want to talk about power? How about speed? Lilu is a hyper-intelligent, genetically engineered, perfect being. You think that her ancient, infinitely packed DNA hasn't adapted to every possible contingency? Lilu is beyond genius. She learned the entire English language along with the whole of human history and combat in less than two days. That also doesn't include the previous knowledge that she has from thousands of years before. Lilu understands Corbin Dallas, Vito Cornelius, the police, and General Monroe, even though she only spoke the divine language, the ancient language, spoken before time was time. We are never told how old she is, but she speaks a language that existed before time. I think we can safely assume that she's a few million years old. We are shown that she gains knowledge, even while in her armored form, by the flashbacks that she has of the Mangalores shooting down her ship, meaning her experiences far exceed just Earth. Lilu has also proven that she has extreme adaptation abilities in combat and evasion. She escapes a military facility, plans a dive into a moving vehicle, yeah, she timed that shit, and manipulated Corbin into helping her in English using a poster of a poor sad child. She even got the tear down. She understands how to use the advanced computer equipment and guns without being shown. Any weapons that are lying around, she will be able to wield with utmost proficiency. Now, if you're talking about strength, Lilu has that in the bag. She has so much muscle power that she breaks through an unbreakable glass container and jumps through a wall. With her protein intake, that woman has to have some muscle. Two whole chickens? Oh wait, <laughs> she is in fact perfect. She also beats up 15 Mangalores with her bare hands, most of them taking only one punch or kick. And we're talking about a race of warriors and smugglers so badass that many governments have banned them from their territories. Agility-wise, Lilu can dodge bullets and has gymnastic-like skills, such as backflips and swinging herself into the crawl space in one movement. And while we're talking about her physical abilities, how about we talk about her durability? This is a woman who makes a hole in the metal top of a taxi. The bullets of the police cars don't even make it through the metal. She sustains more damage than the Mangalores and is still kicking from hundreds of shots from the ZX-1, which has replay technology allowing it to make multiple hits after the first one struck. Lilu has been genetically programmed to wake up, learn, find the stones, and save the universe. She has done it thousands of times before and will do it thousands of times after. This need to find and protect the stones and save those around her will focus her attentions on what she needs to do to defeat River. The diva, Plava Laguna, was the previous possessor of the stones. She can speak to all of her surrounding guards using telepathic abilities, but she is unable to speak to Lilu or to send her information. This is either because Lilu's perfect mind is impenetrable, or because the diva is afraid of the psychic overload that will occur when she opens her mind to Lilu. You think that one normal person's thoughts are a lot? Try ancient memories, history, and languages. That would be one hell of a big boom to the brain. Bada boom. Bada boom. <laughs> I'm going to start with what I suspect our opposition will lean on the most. River's telepathic abilities. First of all, your honor. As Sharon said, River may not even be able to see inside Lilu's mind. And if she can, she may not be able to handle such an overload. In the episode Objects in Space, River hears her various shipmates talking and goes to see what they're up to. As she passes each one, she hears their unspoken thoughts as they speak to each other and recoils more and more from the emotions behind those thoughts until she eventually hallucinates. Even though her amygdala was removed, she still feels emotions. She just doesn't process them 
learn from them. Her brother Simon even says she feels everything. She can't not. If she could get into Lilu's mind, it would be a fucking Pandora's box. Uncontrollable telepathy is already shitty without diving into the mind of a being that predates fucking time? Just ask Jean Grey. Maybe the Firefly should drop her off at Xavier's school for gifted youngsters before she tries to roll up on the supreme being. Even yes. though her telepathy is clearly a major factor in her combat prowess, at the end of the day, River is just a teenage mutant ninja human, and the <laughs> mutant part is the telepathy. Nah. She just has human levels of strength. Like, we never see her punch through unbreakable barriers or straight up kick swords in half like Lilu does. It is never established that River has anything more than human levels of endurance. Lilu, however, fell several stories into a taxi and only had a few little scratches to show for it. The most injured you ever see her is after Zorg shoots her many times with his very high-powered gun, and she wasn't even bleeding all over the place. River's fighting style is a hybrid of kung fu and kickboxing with a little danciness worked in. Lilu's style is like all the styles. She was designed to protect, and then we see her speed reading all of human knowledge. You know all the martial arts are included in all the human knowledge, yeah? Here's what I visualize happening. Lilu and River run into each other. They briefly exchange suspicious looks that could only mean, I don't know you, therefore you're an enemy. River cannot mm -hmm. look into Lilu's mind. If Your Honor still believes she can, she can see that Lilu wants the stones for world-saving reasons, and or River is overcome by the feelings. If they fight, River, for the first time ever, has to fight someone that actually knows how to kick butt on her level. But the supreme being's punches and kicks will break River's shitty human bones. The only people we ever see River really brawl with are some normal ass people in a bar and Reavers who, though batshit insane, are still just humans. Don't get me wrong, I love River, she green, but Lilu is super green. Mm. Team River blows, Team Lilu burns. <laughs> oh, that was very, that was very, there was a lot of space. <laughs> space <contained in> that. <laughs> Team River, bring on the pitter patter of tiny feet and huge combat boots. I'll grant you, you might not think initially that River Tam is going to be the one to walk away with a win this time around. 90% of the time in Firefly and Serenity, she's a barefoot waif wandering the ship in a sundress, staring into the middle distance and spouting off something cryptic and unhelpful. But 10% of the time, she is a deadly whirling dervish of merciless, unstoppable destruction. That's what Lilu is facing here, and you'll see that her abilities are more than enough to thoroughly dismantle this perfect opponent. Lilu may be able to absorb information quickly, but River is starting this match with a great deal more knowledge and mental processing power. According to River's brother Simon, a genius doctor, River makes him look like an idiot child. Everything she did, music, math, theoretical physics, even dance, there was nothing that didn't come as naturally to her as breathing does to us. She was correcting Simon's spelling at age 3, and was in a graduate program for physics at age 14. You might think that her AP English and science credits won't do her much good in a fight to the death, but part of why she's as smart and knowledgeable as she is, is because of her photographic memory, which applies not only to information, but to movement as well. Just think of that scene from the episode Safe, where she learns a dance after a second or two of watching it, and then performs it with more grace and ease than the people she learned it from. If this fight goes on for more than a second or two, she'll immediately be able to pick up on Lilu's fighting style and counter anything Lilu throws at her. And let's not forget that, in addition to being a super genius, River is also a psychic, able to read minds and see the future. Admittedly, most of the time in Firefly this isn't super useful to her since she typically sees inconsequential things and speaks cryptically about them, but we see her read Jubal Early's mind and objects in space, pinpoint the bodies of slaughtered colonists and bushwhacked, and show the ability to detect injuries in safe and aerial. And in battle, she snaps completely into full-on predictive mode, able to perfectly anticipate an opponent's attacks and counter them completely. Her psychic abilities are the only way to explain her frankly unbelievable fighting abilities, because every fight River gets into, she wins. Handily. Regardless of her opponent, regardless of how outnumbered or outmatched she is, she always, always wins. Hardened criminal, armed and armored, sneaking on board Serenity in better days? One river kick to the jaw and he's down. In downtime, she gets ambushed in the snow by six raiders. We don't even see the fight. We just cut to them all lying dead in the snow, and her, barefoot, because it's a Joss Whedon thing, with no <laughs> weapon, an almost bored expression on her face. River shows off her combat skills a couple of times in Firefly, noticeably in the episode War Stories when she one-shots three enemy soldiers with her eyes literally closed, but she is crazy in the movie. 
She has two huge fight scenes, each with her facing dozens and dozens of armed opponents by herself, and both times, she wins without taking a single hit. In the bar fight on Beaumont, she turns bottles into precise and lethal ranged weapons by kicking them, scales up and down the two-story room, and uses her opponent's weapons against them. Later on, when she has to defend the rest of the crew against a metric shit-ton of cannibalistic space berserkers, she turns into a whirlwind of death, stealing and dual-wielding their own weaponry as her own. These are the Reavers, the horrific space boogeymen who send any right-thinking person into a panic at the very possibility that they might be around, and River curb stomps a room full of these guys. I know that Lilu is physically stronger than River, but almost everyone River takes down is a guy twice her size. Their strength didn't matter because River knew what they were going to do and was able to use her superior skill and reflexes to evade each and every single attack they threw. Lilu can't land a hit when River will be able to anticipate every attack she makes. Look at it this way. Lilu is an alien life form genetically engineered to bring peace and life to the universe. River was engineered into a psychic kung fu killing machine. Which one do you think is gonna win in a fight? Like Dan said, River only gets a couple of fight scenes during Serenity, but they're pretty impressive fight scenes, full of bloody axes and bashed in heads. My favorite part of the last one is that after River is done fucking up the Reavers, those blast doors open completely on their own, revealing River in total badass, just fucked me up some Reavers pose. So either River is telekinetic, in addition to being telepathic, or the blast doors saw that fight and were like, you know what? Let's open up now so everyone can see how awesome she is. She deserves it. <laughs> and then the Alliance troops come in, and there's this moment where, in a different movie, we'd be worried that our heroes are about to be gunned down right in their moment of triumph. But in this movie, we're worried that those poor innocent soldiers may have just made the worst mistake of their much shorter than expected lives. That's how much the presence of River Tam changes things. At any rate, Lilu gets one fight scene in The Fifth Element, and it's somewhat less impressive. Let's start with her opponents, the Mangalores, a warrior race with the ferocity of a badger and the intelligence of another badger. Only this one is the badger that gets held back in badger school every other year, and you're not allowed to make fun of it because it's insensitive, and your mom will tell the badger's mom, and then you're really in trouble. <laughs> Please Just write a say. children's book, Miles. <laughs> I know, I love this story. I want to read this badger story. I, think, I know, you're pandering to Kit and I, but I still appreciate it. <laughs> Which is to say that the Mangalores are idiots. They attack Lilu one at a time, they only occasionally use their guns, and there are numerous shots of two or three of them just hanging out in the background while one of their buddies gets kicked in the face, culminating in that last <laughs> wonderful moment when a Mangalore stands directly behind Lilu, doing nothing whatsoever, while she, like, cradles his comrade's face in her hands for about <laughs> nine hours. <laughs> <laughs> These are the dudes who got hired to deliver a box with four stones in it, failed because they didn't bother to open the box and check that there were four stones in it, and then later are like, hey, here's a box. It probably has four stones in it. No need to open the box and check or anything. <laughs> The fact that Zorg later assumes the same thing leads me to believe that the Mangalores are so stupid, they've turned stupid into an airborne disease. <laughs> and frankly, they're not that great at fighting either, unless you count the time they had, like, way too much fun blowing up a Mondashiwan ship that didn't seem to have anything resembling defensive weapons or shields. Zorg himself says they aren't real killers, as evidenced by the fact that they didn't ask about the red button on the guns he sold them, which makes them self-destruct, and then one of them pushes the button. Beating up a bunch of Mangalores isn't all that big of an accomplishment, but to be fair, it's not like they gave her any trouble whatsoever, right? I mean, the Mangalores never even come close to landing a hit on Lilu, and she was pretty clearly unconcerned about losing that fight. It's an old NFL adage that great teams run up the score on lesser competition. With that in mind, it's conceivable that Lilu could up her game in the presence of a greater threat like River. Except I don't actually think that it is. Look at Lilu's progression over the course of the film. After she's reconstructed, she has to adjust to being a living person. We see her revel in the experience of eating, of picking out clothes, of putting on makeup, and of course, of presenting her multipass. <laughs> Not only is she constantly learning new things, she's also going through an emotional adjustment period, and both those factors define Lilu's relationship with violence. 
Remember, she attacks the Mangalores, not the other way around, because she's experiencing a desire for revenge for the first time. She doesn't quite understand the concept of guns at first, because she would totally have gotten shot by that one Mangalore if his gun hadn't jammed, but then Zorg shows up and sends her into terrified hiding with his guns. The overpowering emotions that go along with the need for vengeance got Lilu through her first fight, but Zorg brings violence into her life on a new scale, one that she isn't at all prepared for. Her experience now is that of a victim of violence. That's what prompts her to type war into her Google image search and discover that humanity <laughs> is actually the fucking worst. The very idea of violence on the scale of a nuclear bomb is enough to make her catatonic. Now, I will of course concede that Lilu is brought back from this state by the power of love, which hooray for the power of love, I'm not denying that one at all. But I do think that Lilu's capacity for violence peaked during the Mangalore fight, when it was all fun and games and throwing people into hallways, because she still didn't entirely understand what she was doing. If we're talking about Lilu at that stage of her development, she will be totally caught off guard by Crazy Eyes River Tam and her willingness to inflict harm, just as she was with Zorg. And if we're talking about Lilu at the end of the movie, she now knows what it's like to hurt people, what it's like to be hurt by people, and the massive levels of suffering that can be inflicted by those who have given in to the violent elements of their nature. As a being of peace and protection who has now learned how to love both an individual and humanity as a whole, Lilu is now even less likely to indulge in the level of violence required to beat River. Being perfect doesn't mean you win every fight you get into. It means you recognize that winning those fights isn't as important as sparing your soul the trauma that comes from truly hurting another human being. In other words, Lilu is too enlightened to win this match, which should take the sting off a little bit when River punches her teeth down her throat. That was really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. in that too. <laughs> now we come to rebuttals. Team Lilu, make the other team go boom, bada boom. <laughs> no, bada boom. I'm going to attack my husband's points if you want to attack your husband. That sounds great. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> all right. We always knew it would come to this. So, first of all, learning like one of Lilu's fighting styles is only going to work if Lilu doesn't break all of River's shitty human bones first. There. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she still has to hit her, and she's trying to hit a clairvoyant who's able to anticipate the attacks of dozens of people at once. Well, I said what I said about the whole mind reading thing, so that's up to me. That, that wasn't mind reading necessarily. She is also precognitive and clairvoyant, so she can see things that are going to happen. Like, she's able to tell where all the dead bodies are on that ship in Bushwhack. She wasn't reading any minds there. For the empathy thing, you're saying that she's too enlightened. She has looked through every single part of history up to V. Which means katanas and every single gun that is known. I mean, it's a good point that she does go through the whole alphabet up to V and, like, learns about weapons, but she clearly doesn't fully comprehend the full scope of what you can do to people until she gets to war. Like, for whatever reason, war is the thing that actually sets her off. And like I said before she didn't really know how to handle Zorg and the bullets. It didn't set her off because she didn't know how to handle it. She didn't know how fucking stupid human beings could be. <laughs> and she was like, maybe you deserve to die, you dumbasses. So, you know, she it like, wasn't wow, an existential I'm gonna, I'm crisis. I'm really sad when I let all of you burn. It's but she was like, really wait, upset. you're going to blow yourselves up anyway? What is wrong with you? Maybe you're absolute evil. I think I said what I said about the unpredictability of her powers. Just wanted to keep that fresh in Bob's mind. You're talking about the unpredictability of River's powers? Of just, yeah, of just like how her mind shit works. She cray cray. <laughs> she cray cray. She cray cray, she hallucinates, and it's not always going to work out for her, especially when she's fighting someone who has like equal, if not superior skill level. Her powers are never unpredictable when she's like turned on. But like, you know, when Ew, she's- Ew, you- Cochino. <laughs> Cochino. <laughs> yeah, I know. Wasn't the best phrase. When she's in combat mode, she's lucid, she's focused, her powers are working for her. The only time we see her having difficulty keeping her own grasp on reality or her own powers is when she's like wandering around the ship, just sort of like gazing blankly at stuff. But like when she's in a fight, she's totally focused and her powers are working for her. Mm, wasn't that one episode that uh, her and her brother got like kidnapped by those people? Like those dudes just grabbed her and she let it happen. Yeah, again, she wasn't in combat mode then. She's in combat mode. Why for is she going? Oh, really? Yeah. 
How do we know she's not going to like snap out of combat mode? How do we because know that she's not going to feel overwhelmed by Lilu? There's only two ways that she snaps out of combat mode. One is that Simon has to say a very particular phrase that breaks her out of it, or when her opponents die, as happens uh, with the Reavers at the end of Serenity. Those are the only two times we see her enter and exit combat. That, that we've seen, you're trying to cover the fact that she is telepathic, and that will overwhelm her quite a bit when she... When she fucking, because Lilo gonna give it so, to her. Final points. <laughs> when you're talking about the Mangalore fight, that they were only one at a time and that they were stupid, they had the same ability of figuring out where the stones were and what was going on. The only thing they didn't seem to have was Lilu's particular sense of knowing where the stones are because she's kind of psychically linked with the stones and can feel their presence. Because she looked at the box in her hands and was like, oh, the stones aren't in here. But everyone else thought the stones were where it made sense for them to be. So I don't think they're a particularly stupid race. They are still a fighting race. And somehow they've lived this long, you know? I they mean, haven't been killed by the rest of the universe. No. But they do attack her more than one at a time. Because when the one guy is standing outside the door, three guys fly out the door at the same time. Like, well, one after another. Okay, well, first of all, I don't think that means they're attacking her more than one at a time. I think that means she's attacking them. She's taking on two of them at once. Whenever they go on the offensive, they go into single combat and the others stand around and watch. As regards the the stones being in the box, I mean, they knew that the stones were going to be in that hotel because they, like, they got intelligence on that. They overheard it. That's how they knew it was there. They were just, like, ransacking the place and pulling out all the diva's clothes until they found until they found a box, at which point the guy was like, hey, I found it. It's the first box that I got to. Maybe that doesn't make them stupid, but... Pushing the red self-destruct button, and in the background, we're seeing them play with the net guns and web each other up? I don't know. They don't seem particularly bright to They me. didn't die from that, though, and she punched them and knocked them out. Because the head mangler, you see bloody later. Pretty sure a lot of them died. No, because he's okay. the one who pushed the button. Well, I, I, these are all they salient, all look the same to me. beautiful, and oh, Miles, too far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Team Lilu. Thank you, Team River. Now, Team River, time to tell the other team their argument is broken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that was only one rebuttal? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> well, good, I have more to say. <laughs> I want to point out the fact that the second that Zorg shows up with an actual gun and the ability to use it properly, Lilu takes the hell off. She hides in a ventilation shaft. But, like, here's the thing. She then just proceeds to hang out in the ventilation shaft in the fetal position, while Zorg fires away at her with impunity. Like, she very easily could have crawled in any direction into another room, which is the point of a ventilation shaft, but we see that when she encounters something that's actually genuinely threatening to her, she just panics. She has no idea what to do. My dude, fear keeps you alive. That's the problem with River. Because she got her amygdala removed, she has no fear response. She's gonna do shit that's gonna get her killed. No decision-making skills. Lilu's decision was to curl into a ball and let herself get shot. But did she die? <laughs> she also tried to run through the thing and he fired in front of her. So she was choosing not to run into bullets, which to me sounds like a logical decision because people squishier than bullets. The whole amygdala thing, I'm not sure where you were getting your information on that one, just because, as described in Firefly, what the amygdala does is allow you to push back whatever you're feeling and to not feel it for a brief moment. So River does have a fear response. She does have all those emotions that you talked about her not having. In fact, she has them more strongly than, than most people, so I'm not sure what the... I mean, I actually about. researched what amygdalas yeah, the and amygdala the lack thereof the do. I memory mean, processing, decision-making, and emotional response look, center of your brain. Facts should never get in the way of what is portrayed <laughs> on the screen. Amen. That's what Joss Whedon thinks the amygdala does. We're, we're only seeing a fraction of what like the amygdala does. That like They're like, all right, we'll take this convenient part of it and we'll, we'll blow that up a little bit. You guys mentioned that the Mangalores were so bad Ass that they've been banned from various places, but like, you don't need to be badass to get banned from somewhere. Like, I'm pretty sure you could get banned from McDonald's if you walked in there naked, but it's not because they fear your badassness. Because you're an idiot and you're an annoyance. From. Except every time that name is mentioned, all the humans are like, oh shit, Mangalores. Like I'm that. sorry, you want to talk about a name that invokes fear? Say. How about freaking Reavers? Okay, they're listen. crazy humans! Yeah, they'll just listen. try to eat you! 
You know, if you go see Jeffrey Dahmer, I'm sure he'd scare you a little bit. But he's just you're talking reaver. about Jeffrey Dahmer, the people Dahmer. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! Oh yes, that mean. Uh, okay, you're trying to play up reavers are like like they're so hot. They're still just humans. They're not scary because they're skilled. They're scary because they have bloodlust and regular lust in like the worst way. And also, they come at you like. 50 at a time, which they, is what River fought off. They come at you as many as they can at a time because they cray cray. Yeah, um, and I'm River gonna... killed all of them. Yeah, because they stupid ass humans with shitty little human bones. I want to ask one question because I actually am legitimately curious when you brought this up. Paul Laguna being like telepathic? She can talk to her guards without using words. Okay, I'm- And send them places and tell them to do things. Like, I think it's definitely possible that she has a connection with her people. I think it's definitely possible that she's been with them so long they kind of already know what she wants, but she definitely sends them places with looks. I don't know that that translates to her being telepathic, and even if it did, I definitely don't know that translates to- her not wanting to read or not being able to read Lila's mind. Miles, could you look at okay. Sharon and she would just like know what, that you wanted her to go talk to someone over there? I will point out all of the stuff that she's seen doing with her guards, she could have easily done with a Bluetooth. Like there's <laughs> got to be some measure of advanced communication technology and it doesn't have to be much more advanced than what we already have for she her to be able to send them signals. This is she also the knows shed. the future. She tells Corbin okay, what's happening. Wrap She's it up because somebody psychic. said Bluetooth. <laughs> <laughs> she knew that Lilu was going to need love. She knew that he was the one to help her. She knew that he was connected with her, obviously because she read his mind. So how else is that to be, you know, thought about? Yeah. Okay, you all get the same amount of gold stars. Yeah, but our okay. gold stars are better. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> our, our gold stars are sure psychic. Are, everybody. Everybody's gold <laughs> stars are better than everybody else's gold stars. We can all agree on that. Space, what did you do? <laughs> did you let the two main characters fall into another reality? <laughs> no, I'm not going to bring you new characters. You'll just have to play by yourself and hope they come back. <laughs> Space in its carelessness, has opened up a wormhole. Lightning Ooh. crashes! Because it's the lightning round! Oh! Oh! I know. Oh my, Every oh my god, ladies and gentlemen, this is amazing. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there's a lightning coming down from the sky. <laughs> lightning crashes, then music swells. The colors are richer, the texture more lush. Is that a full orchestra in the background? Where did all these happy little forest animals come from? That's right. Aww. Disney has breached the final <gasps> frontier. Space! You've fallen into an alternate dimension of Disney films, and you are about to be a Disney princess. Yay! Oh, shit, yes! Son. Advocates, what genre of music will your big musical number be? What anthropomorphic little buddies do you have? What important lesson will your princess learn about herself over the course of your story? And most importantly, what piece of Disney branded tie-in merchandise will every kid have to have so they could be just like you? Team Lilu went first in the main round, so Team River will go first in the lightning round. Take it away, Team River. All right, so uh, for the, the musical number, I think it's pretty clear, um, you know, River has a great appreciation for music, especially music you can do, like, dramatic dancing to. When she hears the, the Plava Laguna song, you know, that's going to be pretty inspiring. And um, given the, the two hosts on this particular side of the argument, I think that some symphonic metal would be the appropriate way to go here. <laughs> I, um, I think that's the only way to go. I think it is the only way to go. Basically, she's going to sing opera while thrashing guitars and uh, other elements of metal go around her. And you know how, like, in every Disney movie, the villain song is the best song? That trend is going to be beyond snapped here, because all the kids are going to be singing the fucking metal-ass Princess River song after this Absolutely. Movie. Wow. Um, I, I think uh, in terms of Anthro Buddies, there's a Serenity comic called Better Days, where the crew manages to, like, get a whole <laughs> bunch of money, and... It, and you get to see these little fantasies that each of them have about, like, what they're going to do with it. Most of the time, it's kind of sensical, if, like, a little absurd. You know, like, Jane gets his own ship and stuff. But, like, Rivers involves her standing in a meadow, wearing a very pretty dress, apparently getting married to a fish man. <laughs> which, <laughs> it's 
great. I don't know how money can do that, but obviously <laughs> her anthro friend and romantic interest is the prince of the fishes. Well, the, the fish prince. <laughs> I mean, Simon did turn down her marriage proposal in that yes, scene. Yes, exactly. So she went on to a fish. So yes, very charming fish prince as her uh, anthropomorphic animal companion. Fish prince. Yeah, which actually helps to reinforce the lesson, at least what I see is the lesson of this film, um, which is that it's not okay to marry your brother. Um, <laughs> yeah. But fish, yes. Fishmen, yes. There, there is the, a fishman, of course, but there is that deleted scene in the one episode of Firefly mm-hmm, where she tries mm-hmm. to get Book to marry them. Yep. It's a great scene. <laughs> so yeah, uh, incest is bad, kids. Yep. It does bad things to the gene pool. Don't do the, it. The other, thing, right. the other thing that she learns while she's there, though, is, you know, so much of the time... She sort of brushes up in unpleasant ways against the crew in terms of, you know, like she has a lot of mental issues and a lot of them don't really have the patience to try to, you know, get to know her and get to understand her and work with her and such. And so, you know, a lot of what her journey is in Firefly and Serenity is sort of about her, like feeling a lot of shame for who she is. But what this movie is going to show her, what her, her time in this Disney world is going to show her is that. Being a crazy psychic kung fu murderer means never having to say you're sorry. And that's a very important lesson to learn. I agree. It's really nice. I agree. As for um what all the kids are gonna wanna get uh to be just like River, I think the answer is clearly a lobotomy. <laughs> oh wow. Uh, oofa, oofa. Ah, just just to get just ah, take out that amygdala, burn. huh? Take it right out. <laughs> Be the I, mean that. Oh, wow. I mean, I was going to say they were going to be those shoes where, like, you know, you have the individual little toe pockets, but they just look like bare feet so that you can walk around and look like you're barefoot, but actually not be barefoot. But all right. I mean, I mean going straight closer, for the frontal yeah. lobe there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's how I roll, motherfucker. Sure, I guess. <laughs> oh, God. All right. You get well, like an ice pick and a hammer and like a little map. Yeah, in it's, the it's kit. a little lobotomy kit. That's right. I like that. Oh, oh, God. oh God, no! Well, I'm so glad that I did this. You know, I mean, I don't. I, why would I have regrets now? Why would I? Space. <laughs> okay, Team Lilu can't fuck it up more than a child lobotomy. So take it away. <laughs> <laughs> As the old saying goes. <laughs> Well, first of all, for the music, she'd, of course, like Plava Laguna, one of the most badass opera pieces yeah. it's a ever, great song. ever played. I think she also might like some other badass female singers, you know, like, I don't know, Pink. Yeah, sure. I can see you <laughs> listening to Pink. I think anything that's like classical, but works in like hip hop, mm-hmm. like, because that's basically what that diva's doing, like right in the middle. It just gets so good. Oh, I know. I was like, oh, this is pretty boring <laughs> opera. All right, all right, all right. Oh, shit. What's this? <laughs> that's an I want song. There's your Disney I want song, man. Nice. You know what? In this I want song, she realizes she wants more than this fucking bullshit that Corbin's trying to give her, which she learned after all of this whole movie, after getting down and then seeing that Corbin is actually a shallow fuck. Is the value of loving herself. Because, look, uh, the only time Corbin says anything good about yeah. her, he, he's basically talking about her looks. He's a fuck face. He's going to yeah. cheat on her yeah, yeah. or just be a douchebag. She's going to dump his ass off a several story building and then go uh-huh. to save other worlds by her damn self with his cat. She's going to take his cat. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you saying that she, her song is going to be, I want to go where no people are? <laughs> <laughs> basically... <laughs> this is, she saved I want to go where there gonna are no assholes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Walking around with those, what do you call them? Cocks. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> For the animals, I think she's going to have all of them. Because, you know, I'm pretty sure they oh, probably wow. speak the ancient language. And she can just talk to all of them and, and cuddle with them. You and she will speak any language. She understands English without hearing it before. So obviously she speaks oh, yeah. squirrel. I will say. And horse. Oh, yeah. I would love to see River do the, the, the bee dance, you know, they do to like yes. tell each other where they're going. Yes. Aww. See? Lilu would totally be able to communicate because she always finds a way to communicate with everyone. So she'd be like, hey, they're, you know, doggy and start barking and they totally understand her. <laughs> I'm going to say she might have a complex relationship with chickens is all <laughs> I'm going to bring up. Hey, um, chicken. chick- chickens Chican. eat each other, dude. 
But chickens I, have a complex just relationship it's complicated. with chickens. That's her relationship status on Facebook with chickens. Is it's complicated? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then for merch. Uh, oh boy, for merch. Obviously, obviously, the stones, like little toy version of the stones that light up when you put the correct element on them. <laughs> and then, if you Your arrange kids them around play with yourself. Fire. <laughs> Hey, there was that one Barbie that made the sparks in her little, like, roller skates. It's true. It's been done. Uh, if you arrange the stones around yourself, they work in tandem with the rubber suspenders that you also buy. And then that folds oh out into God. a magical Disney princess dress that's made out of Aww. that, like, bronze metal that her people wear. And it will protect you from boys when they're being mean. <laughs> <laughs> or just Aww. being, apparently. <laughs> and then also temporary tattoos. Yeah, oh. and the little elements. This was a really nice journey. I mean, mostly nice. Not always. But I mean, you know, it had niceness in it. Yeah. 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 You know. <laughs> Maybe the fifth that element was love all along. I mean, it was. <laughs> I mean, that's not I that's mean, not subtextual, Dan. That's textual. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, love saved them both. Because, I mean, without sure. love, I think River might have stayed crazy. It was just brother love. I I have to go make yeah. make thoughts. So you guys discuss the true nature of love in the universe. Okay, bye. Bye forever. Bye. Yeah, that movie's basically just Captain Planet. Like that <laughs> yeah, was, it is. That was my conclusion when I watched it the first time. I was like, oh, okay. They gotta let their powers combine and then save the world. Do you think you could activate the windstone if you farted on it? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Okay. I don't think okay. it's unquestionable. <laughs> uh, could you activate the Firestone by making a bunch of shots in a row in basketball? You know? <laughs> like, I was thinking, could you like insult someone real bad next to it? Mm, Ooh, like, burn. Burn. Yeah. like put it in between you when you burn them real bad. Yeah, yeah. That's right. it up. Or yeah. Like yeah. bodily water fluids for water? Skip? Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah, there you y- go. Y'all have the same thought at the same time. <laughs> I was not thinking spit, but sure. You, know. you could also probably <laughs> pee on it, but yeah. you know. It's just, for girls, it's like, you would have to climb up there, unless you had, like, that weird urinal thing that they have. <laughs> It'd just be way too much work. <laughs> like, when you have female anatomy, it's just, it's more difficult sure. to get the shot yeah. up there. I you mean, might want to consider spitting in that circumstance. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> if, if the stone was lower to activate it, then I might consider peeing on it. I really want to know, like, the specifics of how much... Because, like, you see him, like, gently blow on the stone, and though it doesn't work, you have to, like, blow harder. Yeah. I want to yeah. know, like, how much has to be there. Because it seems Yeah, because like- you would think, like, when, when they open the door into the tomb, that's going to, like, adjust the air pressure, and there's going to be a breeze. But the stones but didn't like- start. The stones weren't in there yet. That's right. Oh, you're right. You're absolutely you, right. You, you mean when they open the door to the tomb and find the, the corpse of that alien that's <laughs> been there for the poor thousands yeah. of years? Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, Dan, I, we definitely have to get into, at some point, why you hate the fifth element so much. Uh, um, I don't know if we want to get into that right but, now. <laughs> but first, if you could only pick one, which member of the crew are you sleeping with? Oh. Mm. That's such a toughie. Like, it'd be Wait, Wash this is for Firefly? or Zoe. Yeah. Yeah. Wash or Zoe? Wash or Zoe. If it was fifth element, it would be it would be Mila Jovovich. Well, yes. Because I want to marry oh, that yeah. woman. Not That's why so she- not Lilu, but Mia Jovovich. Oh my god. <laughs> well, yeah. Either and or both. <laughs> I love Mila Jovovich in general. Like, she's so good at doing her own stunts, and she's so sexy. I don't know. I really like the Zoe Wash dynamic. I mean, it's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. To I me. gotta say, I, that makes me pretty happy that you said Wash, because if I'm in any way like any of those characters, <laughs> yes, he is the one. <laughs> yep. 100% wash. I think, uh, That's what you would sleep with? No, I'm saying Miles is wash. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, you know, get me drunk enough and we'll talk, but, Yeah, you know. for sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of Kaylee, personally. That's I think she's, she's, she's my favorite. Kaylee is like, so Sharon. <laughs> she is, right? I know. It's, it's, like it's perfect. Just, Zoe's tempting, but I am kind of afraid she might break me in half. So, <laughs> I'd probably have to go with Inara, would be yeah. my pick. She's she's gorgeous, that's for sure. Yeah, Mar- Marina Baccarin is uh, she's hot. She's super smart too. Like she's just one of those characters. They have really fleshed out female characters. Yeah, so yeah. they're yeah, like they even do. more attractive because they're beautiful, like physically beautiful people, but they're also just so amazing that you're like, oh, all of you. 
I also love that every two characters have a very specific relationship with each other that is very easy to yeah. like, pin down. Yeah. You know, like you, I could give you any two characters and you can immediately describe how they feel about each other. And it, it would be different from any other characters if, on the show. If there's one thing Whedon excels at, and there are many things he excels at, but if there, I had to pick one thing that he excels at the most, it's character dynamics. And like, yes. he is the master of the ensemble cast. Um, yep. Kit, who would your choice be? Oh, Mal. I love that cowboy aesthetic. I knew. I, as soon not. as this question was asked, I knew your answer before I knew mm-hmm. my answer. <laughs> also, also, he's just... Nathan yeah, Fillion is a gorgeous man. Young Nathan Fillion was quite attractive. Oh, yeah. He's you gotten only- deadly now. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll all get deadly, so it's fine. <laughs> so, Dan, on a scale of 10 to 10, how much do you love Ruby Rod? <laughs> <laughs> we 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 can't have this conversation. I yes, we love can. Ruby Rod. He's my favorite character, and Dan hates him. We just can't. He's the best. <laughs> he is this amazing character. I feel like he pushed some really cool gender norms before it was normal to push gender norms. And you're like, whoa, you are an amazing character. I just adore you. Dan just doesn't like Besson movies. Yeah, <laughs> I, oh, I, I, I'm yeah. such a fan know, of Luc Besson really? movies. I, know, I knew Dan wasn't a Besson fan. I still want to hear more about Dan's problems, but he doesn't want to talk, apparently. So, you know. Yeah, I know. I know, I've got... I've got- I just want to have this conversation. I don't even want to make it. To it, was easier, it was easier to make him rap than make him talk about how much he hates fulfillment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not the judge, man. <laughs> oh, that'll, wait, wait. That'll if be a I, lightning round if, sometime. Okay, everybody talk about fulfillment. <laughs> 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 then you'll uh, have to do it. Well, all of your who you'd sleep with were very adorable and sweet. <laughs> you're peeping this whole time, huh? Oh, of course, always. <laughs> she was like, as soon as we started talking about who we wanted to sleep with, Bob's like, Whoa. spider. I know, Bob's, I was like, Bob's spider sense went off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I started. I mean, this whole time I was just reading fan fiction. I wouldn't even think about the match. <laughs> Can we ask oh. Megan Bob what her choice would be? Oh yeah, Bob. Oh. Bob, what would you? Who would you go I for mean, in the Firefly crew? Oh, you guys are gonna not like me. No, is it Mister Dink? Oh, shut up, Dan. <laughs> Of course it is. No, I mean, honestly, <laughs> it would probably be Jane because I would not feel bad for anything I did or said to him. I'd be like, <laughs> if I wonderful. kicked him out later and was like, "Get no, I don't share space. I don't share, bl- get the fuck out. I'd be like, oh, I don't feel bad. You get out. Jane I see. Is- so you're going straight for the one that you would feel fine about, like no strings attached. Oh yeah, that I could just abandon like in a Man. in a restroom and then never see I again think, and go whatever. Well, that that <laughs> like works that. on a metal level too. That would work better if you just went straight to Adam Baldwin because, like, as bad as Jane is, oh, Adam yeah. Baldwin oh, yeah. is no, so Adam much Baldwin's worse. Adam Baldwin's a terrible, terrible monster of a human being. But I do try to the extent possible to whenever I watch Firefly to go like, all right, Jane is separate somehow. Yeah, you have to. Okay, uh, as per usual. Everybody came hard. Everybody made amazing points. Rebuttals, clear, but also less shouty than usual. So, like, extra gold stars for everybody for Yay. maintaining some, like, some decorum. We're coming well, up in the world, guys. I think I think we were trying to avoid that aforementioned couch time. So that might <laughs> have something to do with it. Oh, wow. We need to do this all the time, then. That was incredible. Uh, couch time will be determined by the winner. Or a loser, <laughs> oh, no. I should say. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, Bob, I mean, make the right decision here. It may not be the one you're thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I did end up siding with Team Lulu. Oh. Woo! Woo! Oh. I know. I know. I I really feel like they convinced me that she simply is not human. That her non-humanness is the thing that will help. Like, on a fighting level... On everything else, I was like, okay, they're pretty evenly matched. And then there were even some areas where I felt like River had the edge. But they they came hard on the she's just not of this earth. You did it, Sharon! When you love a character, they win. That's true. (laughs) That's very true. Yay! So I mean, I is uh, everybody safe from the couch or is nobody safe I, from the couch? Are we all are we all sharing the couch no, together in I, some sort of I in some know. sort of polyamorous couch it, arrangement it, where it, all of our couches have sex? I mean, it's like a weird sense eight thing. <laughs> 
No, no, no. But it's like, but it's the couches fantasy. It's not like it's the couches <laughs> imagining the other couches and then the couches all being like, oh, and then there's like an ottoman in the background and stuff being like, oh, hey, this is hot. Can you imagine if there was that, if like the telepathic hive mind and sensate just inexplicably involved random pieces of furniture? It's like, <laughs> what? Why is there always this lawn chair here? <laughs> Wait, I've got this overwhelming this sensation of being a toaster oven. Here. <laughs> I feel warm suddenly. All right, well, good game, y'all. Uh, it was, yes, it was very oh lots of fun. You guys, guys were, were beautiful and precious, and all of you are winners. Dan, it's going to be okay, buddy. He gets to sleep in bed. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the greater victory, if you ask me. <laughs> I may have lost the battle, but I won the war. <laughs> also, do you know what this means, though? What's that? When it's one of my favorite characters, you shouldn't go against me. Yeah, uh, I have <laughs> learned my lesson. The experiment has happened, and it'll never happen again. So, you know, just... It's time for the kit thanks. Quiver, ladies, quiver. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sad I didn't get to go bzz, bzz, to people during their rebuttal. Oh, shit. Over to Twitter. Thank you to Cosplay Fiend, Hayden Reynolds, Brad Boltman, Raphael Medina, the You, Me, and Duffy podcast, the Lawn Disorder podcast, Musicals Taught Me, Sharon Holden. Hmm. hmm. Sharon. Hmm. hmm. Thank you. And Sabina Bashar. And on Tumblr, thank you to Forte Joe Star, a Pizamon. Fat Blunt 69, Jeep yeah! Prime. Fat yeah, Blunt 69! Fat Blunt. Oh, sorry, I forgot we need a moment of appreciation. Yeah, it's like pausing we... for doom. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I know, we Fat all Blunt 69. wish that's yes, who we yes. were. Jeep Prime and Changing Shades. And on Facebook, thank you to Jeff Beely, Jeffrey Ketchum, Robert Ramsey, Viola Sanderlin, and Nate Swanson. I feel like I forgot to uh, add in, add a son of a gun. Hello, friend. Thank you for always being awesome. I also wanted to thank Christian Danielson and Richard Bethke, uh, who are our featured patrons this particular week. And they were cast as frightened space casino uh, goers, I guess. <laughs> I mean, but you got big dreams. You got yeah, big absolutely. dreams. absolutely. They got their sights on the stars, which you often do in space. If you too would like to uh, be cast in our story, you can do so by becoming a patron at any level from $1 and up. And uh, we will fit you into the story in some weird and goofy fashion. And that's also how you can get it on the fan voting for what podcasts we do, what episodes we do, and which characters we use, which is how this particular episode got made. And uh, we, we had a lot of fun doing it. So yes. Um, yes. if you want to contribute to that and become a patron and uh, vote on which matches we do, go to patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast and give us some money. Go to patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast and donate $5 or more, and you can vote in the polls to decide what matches we do, and, like, especially if you go up to $10 or more, you can vote on all kinds of other stuff, like what our monthly bonus content is. Very much looking forward to uh, the song from Liz this month. Um, yes. Yeah. Last month was a bonus episode with Colin and I discussing Terminator 2. Megan, Bob, do you want to pick a second anniversary episode question to throw to us? Oh, you know what? I got to do most underrated Disney animated movie by Michelle. <gasps> Le oh, well, that's since, that, since Sharon's here, that's a perfect question. Yeah. yeah. Especially given the lightning round. I mean, and I got strong feels. So this let's, is, well, let's is hear it. underrated Disney animated movie, huh? Yeah, underrated. Okay. Well, I mean, no, I want to hear what everyone else has so I can ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the one that gets unfairly overlooked the most is maybe The Great Mouse Detective. Um, oh, that was oh a that's a good yeah. movie. I read it's some like, very compelling fic about that. It's pretty dang close to being like Disney Renaissance level good. It's a really, really strong movie. That's a fun movie. It's just great. Yeah, yeah Isn't it's awesome. is it like Vincent Price or something as Radigan? It's, yeah. Pff, that song. He is a weirdo, but it's great. I think my pick would be The Rescuers. Oh, mm. really? That was now. Rescuers, not rescuers down under. No, rescuers. The first one, huh. the one with the little girl Penny. Yeah, gets, oh, like, that kidnapped. one's grim as. Fuck. That's good because I feel like everybody remembers rescuers down under, but Which, rescuers is super good. I love rescuers. I always loved the name Penny because of oh. her name in that movie, oh. and she was like this badass, tough little girl who was like I don't know four or five years old, and she's like, "No, fuck you, woman." No, it was, it was pretty badass. <laughs> I liked yeah. her. <laughs> I need to rewatch that one because I I remember it. I just don't remember it. Yeah, it's like, I know I watched that, but what happened? It's far from being a perfect movie or even a particularly good movie, but I don't think it deserves the obscurity that it's been relegated to. 
um, which is The Black Cauldron. Mm-hmm. Really? I, mm. I do like that. I, I did read the book. Yeah. So the books are wonderful. Yes. And some of my favorite kids fantasy books in existence. Mm. I've read them a million times. The movie is not exactly like the books. It's kind of the first two books like mixed together. And like there are some real problems, but I think it's honestly fun to watch, especially like if you can get your hands on the original cut, which was super dark. And mm-hmm. actually, uh, they forced the creators to cut a number of scenes because they didn't want to just scare the living shit out of kids. I have a real soft spot for The Black Cauldron just because I love the books it's based on and because I think it's better than it's made out to be. I remember when I was a child, I really liked Oliver and Company, though I feel like I need to rewatch it as an adult to be able you know, to analyze it. Dude, I so was, me not seeing it. I was so into Oliver and Company. Yeah, it was that, really the cute. The songs hold up so well. Still. Fucking Billy They're Joel great. is in that movie. Bette Midler singing? Oh my God, it's great. All right, um, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Ah. Uh, oh, I love I that mean, movie. I know. Oh, I think people have real strong. I mean, okay, I yeah, will say I'm I have talked to multiple people who have said it was a sexual awakening. We shall not talk about why. Uh, but, Esmeralda. Uh, <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> Duh. Dude. Oh, okay, that was not the direction I was going, but sure. Oh. Um, you Are know you what? You're right. Off? Absolutely. <laughs> Let's let. <laughs> look. Look. I did not come here onto this podcast to be king shamed. To judge. Yeah, to, to get. Oh my god. Kit Kit, I thought I thought you were like oh Yeah, seriously. No, it's it's this, is, this plus the Mr. Dink. <laughs> this is not, not a good look for you, Kit, right now. I'm just saying. Like you know. No, it's just your I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's no, your, I know. It's look, your fervor. People, your fervorous defense. People who like Zorak should not throw ah, fucking rocks. That's rock, true. Okay? Seriously. That's why that's why I'm laughing so hard because <laughs> I'm also uh, a furry. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> good for you. Yeah, Tony J singing Hellfire is like, I, it's oh, pretty oh, unfucking yeah. believable. Hellfire is and the also, best Disney villain song, in my opinion. It's, it is the greatest, and it's so, I feel like that's the great thing about Hunchback of Notre Dame, is that it is, if you've ever read the book, it's horrifying. And yeah. everybody dies. And then yeah. they take it, and they manage to preserve a lot of the horrifying aspects of it. And still make it just like God help the outcasts. That oh, shit yeah. is so sad, but it's yeah, so good. It yeah, it it's gave just me a shame that, the that then they take a giant dump on it in the form of those three stupid gargoyles. <laughs> yeah, they I mean, yeah, their that names was... are Victor Hugo and they're Laverne. Cute. I know, but I hate the worst. Characters. Oh. Yeah, no, but I mean, uh, it's got some, it's got some cool shit. I, don't even I, also, I own that movie. Megan popular Bell, uprisings I... by oppressed people. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Smash Fiction. Next week, the 21st episode of Extraordinary League. And after that, Smashtoberfest is upon us with a creepy Stephen King matchup. Jack Torrance of The Shining versus Annie Wilkes from Misery. Smash Fiction is produced by Miles Schneiderman and production assistant Sharon Schneiderman with logo design by Claire Mulcairin. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod of the clan McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Hitman. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going, and we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. But the supreme being's punches and kicks will break River's shitty human bones. The only people we ever see River really <laughs> brawl with. I'm so sorry. Just I'll give you a second. Shitty human bones. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, bones. I can hear the the impact. Never like David Boreanaz. Animal bones are so much better. <laughs> oh, that's true. This takes me back to when we were on uh, on San and Moro's team, just shit talking humans. <laughs> <laughs> I know, stupid humans. <laughs> <laughs>
god. I hate them. Okay, uh. sorry. <laughs> oh, they're so smelly. Okay. <laughs> Christian! <laughs> sorry. Oh god. Sorry. Whoa, are you okay? I mean, I was just imitating Chris Tucker. Right? <laughs> <That's pretty. laughs> oh, fair enough. He's super green now. I don't think I actually got <laughs> high-pitched enough with that, but...